A couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to interview Peter Locke, who is a former Google engineer. Now, while he was at Google for his one year as a full-time software engineer, he was in the machine intelligence department and he worked on the machine perception team. Before Google, he interned at Twitter and he studied computer engineering at the University of Toronto. The reason I'm making this video is because a lot of the answers that he gave to my questions were really shocking and I thought you might find them really insightful and just really overall different from what you might hear from a lot of people in the industry. So without further ado, here are my top five favorite answers that he gave me during our interview. Enjoy. Okay, Meet for question number three and four. Meet says, can you talk a bit about how you landed your Google interview and what the process was like? Uh, I had a friend working at Google. I, um, I gave him a referral to Twitter. He gave me a referral to Google. Yeah, I had my work experience at Twitter, so I went through a pretty traditional route for that. What's the other part of the question, the second half? Uh, and then he also said, what was the process like? Process, so for those of you not familiar with Google's process, it's uh, two-pronged. Uh, you have your initial... For reg So I, I went through... I guess he's asking specifically for my, uh, for my case. And I had two phone interviews, after which I had... After which I was invited to the matching stage so where you get matched with the team so i didn't have any on-site interviews because i first came on as an intern and in the matching phase i had several phone interviews maybe four ish and those were interviews with different teams and the team i liked best which was the machine learning team i ended up working on um the two of i like that team so i'll after that interview, I told my recruiter, I want to work on this team. And my recruiter's like, okay, yeah, they want you to work on them, their team as well. And it was a match. So there's basically two steps in the Google process, whether it's for a, as an intern or full-time. The beginning is getting into the inner pool, the matching pool. And then once you're there, you get matched into a team and then you actually start working so there's two sets of interviews and in my case because i started as an intern and while on the job got converted to full-time um i only had to do two phone interviews before i went into the matching stage for normal full-time people it's i believe any number of phone interviews um it could be i think between one and three i'm not entirely sure and then there's a round of on-site interviews um, when they look through your resume, what are some instant yays and nays that stand out? So it depends on what company you're going for, and I'm assuming this is for Google. Uh, yays are you're a competitive programmer. Yays are um, that you have work experience. Yays are you have like put in honest effort if you've showcased work you've done that's a yay um nay nays are like saying i'm proficient at javascript and pretty good at c plus plus like just write down languages that you know and don't rate yourself um that's a nay um another nay is trying to trying to like overly embellish your resume with like bullshit so like having a bunch of projects that weren't really projects like you made like a to-do list or something and you put that on your resume no like instead of like doing four different projects just to make your resume look big do one really good project have a link to it in your resume make it easy for the recruiter to check it out and be impressed and like make you memorable in your mind Nice. Um, so next two questions from Tabish. Tabish says, uh, "What's one thing on the resume? What's one thing on resumes that employers find really great?" Uh, good question. The the answer is work experience. 
<laughs> I mean, I, um, uh, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, one thing uh, someone, actually someone, actually my hiring manager at Twitter, what he told me, um, he found uh, very impressive or something that really sh- stood out on my resume was the fact that I had done a project with a team and that it's like working and running. It shows that not only enough to deliver a project and like keep it running and keep it live and have like a, a user base, but that you can resolve arguments, you can work with a team and that you can together actually you know, come out successful because that's literally what you're expected to do day after day after day when you're working a job for these companies. Wow. So, yeah, any project that can showcase that is is amazing. And I believe that was the only project or maybe one of two projects I had on my resume when I didn't have work experience going to Twitter. What are some examples of... Um... I guess the biggest demographic being students that recently graduated or students that are in third or fourth year trying to get a job. What are some examples of, of limiting beliefs or, or ideas that um, these students might have in their head that might not be true. And, and once they sort of clear their mind of that idea, it would be a lot easier for them to, you know, go and get a, you know, a role at one of their dream jobs or, or become a machine learning engineer at one of them. Nice. Uh, yeah, um, a lot of limiting beliefs. Uh, definitely one I think, which I'm probably not going to address first, is like this idea of like needing work experience beforehand, and maybe uh, someone didn't have work experience um, in their time in college or university. They didn't get the chance of doing internships, so that makes them um, discouraged on their ability to get a job. Uh, the need for work experience, I think, is a limiting belief. I think a huge limiting belief, actually, which came to mind um, just now is this idea that I'm not smart and that I have to find some way of like getting this good job, even though I'm not smart. Um, I don't think everyone fits into this category, but I do know quite a few people go out into the world uh, especially in like this tech space where they have this over their heads that like I'm not good enough or I'm not like naturally smart for whatever reason and because I'm not naturally smart I have to either work really hard or you know I need some kind of edge to be able to like get these really good and lucrative jobs and at the end of the day this like not being smart or not being naturally gifted or something is just a belief like like spit spit on that like dismiss that and just be smart like get smart there's really nothing different between you and someone who's quote unquote smart except the fact that you're telling yourself that you're not smart and then you're behaving in line with that limiting belief if you just stop stop telling yourself that and just like do really great amazing things that smart people do then i'm sure you're going to go on and one be really successful and start achieving these things that quote unquote really smart people achieve and two you're going to feel like you deserve those things you're not going to feel you're not going to go into like these if you do end up landing a job you're not going to go in there feeling inferiority complex which is a really big thing in silicon valley um feeling like oh you know, I have to, uh, you know, be careful or I have to, like, watch my step and listen to what other people say. And, like, I'm here to learn. I'm, there's nothing wrong with being humble and, like, being there to learn and stuff. That, that's all fine. But there's different contexts in which you can think those thoughts. And when people think, th- think those th- thoughts from the context of inferiority, I think that's very limiting in how well they can perform once they do actually get to the job. Like they end up getting this really great job and then 
they struggle to either move ahead or struggle to, you know, be a really stellar employee. I think all of this is just rooted in this one belief that I'm just not smart or I'm not like brilliant. You're all brilliant. Dismiss the idea that you're not. So it sounds like a lot of what you're saying is like, um, like the bulk of the stuff that's actually preventing students from landing a job at a company like Google or one of the top four companies is not necessarily like their natural intelligence or whatever you want to being smart or, or their current skills or anything. It sounds like it's more of a mindset thing. I think I, I'm a firm believer that mindset has a really big role to play. Um, and like we're talking about limiting beliefs. So if I said something, if I said to you that, oh, Google's application deadline for software engineers this uh, coming season or like for 2019 new grads has uh, or has just ended yesterday or it ended like, I don't know, April 30th. And now you believe that. Because of this belief, you're not going to apply for the job until next year. Because you believe that, or you're either that, or your belief is going to change for you to believe that, oh, it actually didn't close April 30th. So just to be clear, I guess what I'm saying is if I make you believe that Google isn't taking any new applications anymore, you're not going to, if you really truly believe that, you're not even going to bother applying because you believe that they're not taking any new applications. It means you're not going to go and check up on whether or not they're taking applications because if you were checking up, that means you're doubting your belief. So when you firmly believe something, you begin to act with that belief without even knowing it. And I think a lot of people have these really firm beliefs that they're not capable of certain things for certain reasons. And then they end up not even thinking, not even imagining that they can do something that's contrary to that belief. In a, in a sense, it's almost like I think a really good way for someone to find out what their beliefs are um, is when, if, if you were to tell someone else about a story of how like someone got a job at Google and then that person's like, oh yeah, but they went to like a top tier school or, but they were just naturally really gifted or but they had like internships when that but comes that's a limiting belief they had and then that gives them reason to just accept why they don't have what they want i see so think about think in the past I, i'm sure you've had these conversations more than i have when people say um like oh i like want this job or like i want to get this job but this what did they say after but? To me, it's usually, from what I remember, it's something like, but I don't have a refer, or a referral, so I'm just going to like get squashed just because I'm going through that online application. Right. But I don't come from like a top school or something, but I don't have a high GPA, which is like the most, uh, nowadays this belief is like not as prevalent but there was a time when people believed they needed like a good gpa to get these top jobs so there's all these beliefs and the truth is they're all false you, if you dismiss those beliefs if you really didn't believe them anymore then you don't have any more reasons to not have the job anymore and then what ends up happening is you end up getting the job because you end up seeing the opportunities and the path that's right for you to get the job so yeah, maybe you do get a competitive edge from being a t like at a top tier school. It doesn't mean you need to be at a top tier school to get the job. The belief just makes just puts this kind of cloud around the head that okay, I'm at this disadvantage, and it just leads to self sabotaging behavior versus like prevalent behavior. Because I definitely didn't go to like a, 
I didn't graduate from a top tier school getting the job. I didn't have like a PhD to get like this machine learning job, et cetera, et cetera. So I had every excuse in the world to like not get the job. So people kind of need to examine their beliefs and dismiss them or like find a way to figure out why it's not true and then like go down that way. Yeah, I mean, I think those are some pretty insightful answers. And I mean, do you have any any other advice that you just want to put out there before we um, end the stream or any advice for everyone watching? Uh, yeah, I think don't really think that much about doing things and stop trying to figure out what exactly it is that you need to do and spend more time actually doing and then let your act of doing help teach you what you needed to know. So by going out and like doing things and learning things about machine learning and trying to solve, solve machine learning problems, on that, let that journey actually help you figure out like the things that you needed to know um, and like the specific, you know, tools of the trade and resources that you need to like really propel yourself in this career. Because to be honest, no one person has all the best, knows about all the best resources or knew about all the best resources when they were starting out. I can tell you, maybe like, I'm sure there are people that had many good, maybe even great resources available to them because their friends told them about them. But no one had the absolute perfect portfolio of absolute best resources and that's the reason they were, they were successful no they were successful because they actually went out and did something right so don't try to figure out what the best way is or the best thing you need to do to get to where you need to go just start moving in that direction and then figure out and acquire those resources along the way there you have it guys i hope that advice was valuable to you and if you have any comments about what peter said or any additional questions leave them in the comments and if you want to tune in on more interviews like this sign up at theforge.ca where we'll be doing this regularly thanks for watching and take care